Thank you all for, uh, for, for joining us today. Drew, thanks so much for, for giving us a chance to, uh, to pick your brain on what's sure. happening next, what's happening in the world of, of HR. Privileged to be with you all uh, today. Um, I'm curious, so at Guild, we are all about looking at career paths, helping people empower a growing, unfortunately, a growing career uh, opportunity uh, uh, pathways that, are, that have increasingly become challenged. When we first had a chance yeah. to meet, I was blown away. Now I've set expectations too yeah, high, but I was blown away by your path to, to head of HR, chief people officer. Yeah. Can you can maybe take a moment and share what, what that career path looked like for you? Yeah, I do have a kind of an untraditional path. Um, I, uh, I spent 20 years in retail, all at Walmart, uh, but I started uh, in a warehouse. I started in a warehouse at Walmart in operations, and I spent about eight years in supply chain uh, operations, and then I moved into kind of a strategy role, and then into uh, retail operations, running our stores around the country, uh, and then uh, kind of made my way uh, into uh, HR. We were running, uh, at the time we had a CEO that was thinking about associate experience and wanted an operator to kick something off, and I went to go do a six month assignment, and I stayed six years in, in HR. <laughs> so I, uh, I did all sorts of roles over those six years, but really focused on workforce transformation, uh, workforce of the future, and then ultimately running HR for Walmart US operations. So uh, it, untraditional path. I, I think I had three or four different careers during that time uh, and just enjoyed it uh, immensely. From there, I had the uh, opportunity to join uh, a new company, which is here in Miami called Lennar. Uh, if you haven't heard of Lennar, we're one of the top uh, uh, home builders in the country. Uh, and uh, we've been around for uh, many years, uh, over 60 years. And what makes Lennar so great uh, is the phenom phenomenal culture of Lennar. And uh, I've been blessed in both places, at Walmart and here, uh, to work for companies that really value associates and they value um, uh, uh, them as an asset and not just a line on the, on the balance sheet. So uh, it's been a thrill so far and uh, we're just getting started here at Lennar. Gosh. Well, we're going to get back into a little bit in, in a couple of moments on maybe what some of the insights that you've had from your sort of diverse career path. I'll say yeah. that fa fair enough and, and talk about how that's influenced some of the decisions that you've made. So obviously, I mean, for myself, I've had more than a, a 30 year career in the human capital space, unlike you yeah. sort of always been in the human capital space. And I can tell you in my 30 years, I have never seen as much change, mm. obviously, uh, as we've we've all seen over these last couple of years. And I truly believe that we're only at the beginning of that as well talk a little bit about the, the, this notion of the, the age of HR. But let me ask you, as you take a look at what's around the corner, um, when we've had a chance to talk, I personally think you're one of the most sort of, you have, you have the, one of the most interesting and pioneering perspectives on what's going to happen next in the human capital space. Could give us, look in your crystal yeah, ball sure. for a second. Tell us, what, what do you see? What, 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 what's up next for HR professionals in our profession? Yeah, so this is just how I see things. So take it for what's worth. But if you think about HR, really, let's say back in the 90s and uh, early 2000s, we we're really a compliance uh, function. Uh, that was the nature of HR. Then we kind of moved into this talent development and training phase, right, where we were really meant to train and develop talent. Not saying that those two things aren't still important, but they kind of added to the portfolio. And then we've, I feel like we've entered in this experience phase, right? Where it's all about how do we have employee experience or for us associate experience. Um, and I think that requires a completely different way of, of thinking. Um, and I, when I think back on how we typically would design um, solutions, for example, we're very compliance based or they're very talent based, I'm sorry, or uh, they were very siloed based. So we started to create these COEs over the years. Uh, and we started to deliver things to our employees in a very siloed way, and it felt very siloed to associates and employees. Where experience comes into play is this mindset of how do you bridge all of that together and create a seamless experience for associates? Because they experience the, uh, the, uh, the company that they work for holistically. They don't think about it in individual ways. So we've kind of entered, especially through the pandemic, was all about how do we create the right experiences? And I think we're still trying to figure out how do we structure our teams to deliver that? What's the technology that we need to underpin experiences end to end? Uh, and I think we're just in this moment and flux of change where we're all trying to figure out, all right, I can understand we gotta improve the experience for people, but how do you functionally do it? Like how do you build a team to actually go do that in a way that's holistic? 
Uh, and I think that's probably what we're all kind of facing is like, what does that look like? So um, I'm going to ask you to double click into that. You are kind enough to share uh, when we were grabbing a coffee that you actually you've just uh, gotten your talent strategy, your sort of yeah. people strategy approved, which I think is very different than at least in my experience, what you know we would have traditionally looked at. Can you really help us understand? So what is that? What does that look like? How are you thinking about that associate experience? How have you even thought about a non-traditional way to design yeah. the HR function to, to, to go after that experience? Yeah, so um, to take a step back, if you think about a employee experience, um, I really think about this through the lens of like a customer experience. So if you're on a customer experience team, you don't think about it in chunks of the experience. You think of holistically, what do you want your, experience, your customers to experience end to end? It also takes a certain mindset to look at that. And I think that's the mindset that we actually need in our HR and our people teams. And so what's worked for me is sub, creating a subset of the team that really looks at what I call the associate or the employee journey end to end from the time you hire all the way time to you leave and looking at that through the lens of an experience mindset. Um, what that takes is different, different skill sets than what you traditionally see in HR. It takes different um, uh, technology and data to think through that way. But if you can separate a team that really looks at things end to end and not through COE lenses, but end to end experiences, that then feeds into solutions that feel holistic. And instead of just you know, rolling out a talent program that our great talent people have come up with, really take time to listen to your employees and create a journey on what you want them to experience and feel, and then develop the solutions behind that that increases it. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a slightly different way of thinking but it takes a pretty radical change in the structure of your teams to be able to pull that off. So I've done this three or four times now, and we're going through our, our uh, the newest kind of round for me is, is here at Lennar. And uh, it's pretty amazing when you separate and get the right skill sets in and you think end to end how fast you can actually deploy solutions that really make the difference. Uh, and we're starting to see that. The other thing that's coming, uh, as we know, is technology. We've been, how long have we been talking about that the administrative work's going to go away in HR, <laughs> right? And we've been waiting to free up our business partners to actually perform uh, value-added services. I think we're finally getting there. I think AI is gonna actually be the technology that comes behind in the next few years that really strips mm -hmm. away the administrative work. And that allows us to rethink the team as well. And this is where we have this idea of associate or employee success teams. People that are really focused on improving the experience and helping our associates or employees be successful um, in a holistic way. So think about wellness, think about community, think about mental health, think about um, coaching, career coaching, and then some HR that's still left. Really think about it holistically as we all do when we work for a company. Uh, and that's where I think we can start to, start to think about um, how to deliver services to our associates, our employees, that they feel like is helping them be successful in life and at work. Um, and that's going to cause you know, quite a bit of disruption on the way we design our teams. And Drew, let me ask you, because I, I love that you gave a specific example of actually thinking about and deploying healthcare professionals, maybe even specifically people with nursing backgrounds mm -hmm. and careers as part of those teams on the ground to think about well-being, to think about thriving, which I think is absolutely will continue to be one of the most important things. Can you just maybe double click on that? I mean, where did that where did that come from? Because that's a non-traditional way to think about people with these experiences to be able to bring those solutions to frontline yeah, folks. Yeah, I, I feel blessed to work at Lennar. It's really forward thinking in wellness. We have a chief medical officer named Dr. Pascal. Uh, he's been with us through the, he started in the pandemic, but even through the pandemic has really started to think, help us think about um, uh, our wellness programs in radically different ways. Uh, and so it's really that mindset that he has for the total corporation. How can we then embed that throughout the team uh, to actually provide a resource to associates. So it really came in uh, understanding what we're doing well at Lennar and then understanding what we can scale. Um, and you know, we'll see where that, that turns out, but I think there's a huge upside in having resources dedicated to wellness. Yeah, I'm gonna pick up on that theme and maybe pivot just a yeah. little bit. So I'm a big fan of Gallup's work. Uh, if you haven't read their, their book on well-being, I'm a huge Gallup fan. They almost seem to like whatever books yeah. they put out, I just think, not only having a billion pieces of data is always helpful to look at it and they're so concise, but in that book, they talk about of the various well-being context of physical, mental, 
uh, social well-being, career well-being, financial well-being, they would suggest that it's career well-being mm. that is most important specifically to our frontline workers. That's right. You have been an incredible evangelist at Walmart and now at Lennar on that helping people think about their careers, mm -hmm. helping them prioritize that. There's an interesting article out just this morning from CNBC on the difference between how executives think about career well-being and employees think about career well-being. Could you maybe just share what, what, what do you see as the future of career well-being and maybe what have you done to, to enable that at, at the places you've worked? Yeah, like I said, I, I've been blessed to work for two companies that see us, the employees as assets and really something that sets us apart. Uh, and I think it starts with that. Uh, you know, one of the things I've been able to roll out some pretty meaningful programs over the years, but that's only because I had a company and a leadership team that valued our people. Uh, and I saw that at Walmart and I see that for sure here at Lennar. Um, and so I think it starts with culture. I think it starts with how you view your people. Um, I think it'd be really hard to do some of these things if you really thought about people as uh, an ends to an, uh, a means to an end. And so I think that's where I'd challenge everybody is make sure that you have the right culture and the right viewpoint on your human capital. Um, the next, I think after that, then it's around, all right, what do we wanna, like, what, what do we need in our company? And this is where I think it's stepping back and thinking about what's the experiences we wanna provide and what's the business outcomes and matching those two together. Because for every company it's probably slightly different. And if you do a really good job of listening to your front line, not listening to your leaders, listening to your front line, they will tell you what they need every single time. I think where we get wrong is we listen to leaders more than we listen to our people. And when you do that too much, you start to develop things that are disconnects to the front line and you start to not serve them and you start to have turnover, you start to have bad experiences, all those things start to happen, right? Um, and so creating those listening opportunities and ability to gather the data and then telling a story of what they're looking for, I think you'll match their needs in the right way. You know, one of the things we've done with Guild, uh, I rolled out Guild two different times, um, which is uh, at Walmart, it was around how to provide upward mobility and give people the ability to get college degrees because we had very low college degrees because of a very large um, hourly population. So we rolled that out and it was a big success. Here at Lennar, totally different scenario. We already had a pretty large amount of our associates that had college degrees, but they needed continuing education and they also need to pay off their student loan debt. So we rolled out probably the most generous student loan repayment program uh, in the country about 60 days ago. And we have 10% of our employees already uptaking uh, this idea of paying back my student loans that I already have. So that's a good example of, you know, at Walmart is one solution because I had a list there in one way. Here it's a different solution uh, because it's different needs and different opportunities. So uh, anyways, I think it, it comes down to listening to the needs of your people and uh, creating solutions for them. Yeah, I love that. Again, two, two, two very similar problems, but coming at it from a completely different context and understanding right. what was most important to the, you know, to the employees. Let me, uh, I'm going to pivot a little bit on that same idea. When we look at some of the, the, the research specifically on AI, um, the McKinsey uh, shared some data recently that they believe that it will be our frontline workers, which actually surprised me, and it surprised some people I've shared with this, that our frontline workers will be 14 times more uh, likely to be impacted in a negative way by AI than, than other workers. And specifically, women will be five times more impacted uh, negatively by, uh, by AI uh, uh, than men, as an example. When you think about AI, both in the context of HR, but even in the context of our workforce, uh, I think it's a recent Deloitte study would suggest that 20 to 30% of the tasks that we currently perform no matter what function you're in, in five years will be automated or augmented. So I do believe, as you, you, know, as you and I have talked about, we're about to undergo probably the biggest shift in the, phys in the way we work than maybe any of us have ever seen. How, how do you think about you know, AI? Where should we be, where are the, where are the opportunities, uh, either from an HR perspective or from a workforce perspective? Yeah, I have a little bit of a different perspective. I, I, uh, my first meeting when I, I told you I, I went into the HR kind of search experience space, my very first meeting I had was with McKinsey. <laughs> and they told me that uh, we were gonna have 50% less people in six years than we had at that point uh, because of all the automation. Uh, that was about seven, eight years ago probably. Uh, Walmart I think has more people now than they used to. <laughs> So you gotta kind of take, you know, McKinsey, I love the great people, I'm sure there's, I don't know if there's McKinsey people in here, but great people, but they sometimes can push a little bit too far. 
One thing I would say, though, is that the tools that are starting to emerge, especially in our space, can finally get us to the point where administrative work gets completed and we can actually pivot our people to, on value-added activities. I talked about this earlier, but that's been the dream for like a decade, right? <laughs> there's, maybe there's some companies that figured it out. I never did figure it out. We, we definitely have reduced administrative work over time, but it's never completely gone away. I think AI has the ability to remove manual uh, tasks and really free up mind share to focus on, like I talked about, experience. Uh, and so I would not shy away from AI. I would be leaning into it um, as much as possible where it makes sense uh, and training our workforce to use it as a tool. Um, I'm finding that our younger, our younger population on, on my team, for example, uh, I see them using chat GPT all the time, right? My son is for sure using it, he's 17. Um, I think everybody, though, needs to be more comfortable with using the tools to help them in, from a productivity perspective. And then there's just some great startups, there's some great vendors that are coming around that I think can actually get us to the point as a function where we are providing real value-added services because a lot of the stuff that we get dragged into, the mundane of our teams, can actually go away. And I'm, I'm seeing real solutions at least coming my way, and we're actually implementing a few that's going to, I think, provide that. Yeah, it was interesting. And uh, I've appreciated the inclusion and diversity perspective in the conference here all, all for We recently did a survey internally at Guild amongst our workforce, and we did find uh, that the that statistically significant number of men and white men are more likely to use uh, a GPT chat than are women and, mm -hmm. and other diverse groups. So I think, again, we should be thinking and looking at that from a diversity lens right. and making sure that we're providing those opportunities for, for everyone and, and being supporters of that. We have about two minutes left. I'd love to maybe get your thoughts for the group. One or two things that, as you, as you look at the future of HR, that you would share with this group and say, hey, I, I, I think this is what we should be thinking about. I think these are the opportunities. What, what would you share, some coaching for this group? You know, I just encourage everybody. I, uh, when I decided to, to take a CHRO role, I was, I was considering operation roles and several other things based on my background. And the reason why I really went down this path was I really think that the work that we do changes the lives of people if we do it well. If we don't do it well, it could actually not change people in a negative way, right? But if we do our job really well, we make a difference. Uh, and I think, you know, I, I, some people think that it's, you know, this employee employer relationship and Employers have the upper hand right now versus employees. I don't believe in any of that. You know, I think there's gonna be a war for talent for a long, long time. Uh, and the best thing that we could do is provide services and programs to develop people so that they can have better lives. And I think if you go with it in that mindset uh, and you approach your work every day with that, it's more fulfilling. Uh, but it's actually, we can do a lot of good work in this function. So um, you know, I just encourage everybody to really think about how you tie to business results, but then really what's the difference you're gonna make in people's lives? Um, and that's what should get you up every morning and be excited about the work we do. Gosh, well Drew, I wanna thank you for your leadership. Someone who came from the biggest sort of procurement uh, supply chain delivery literally in the world, yeah. right? And said, hey, where am I gonna build my career with all that background? I'm gonna go into people. Mm -hmm. uh, I love your leadership there. I love your perspective. We have our respective LinkedIn QR codes. I would strongly <clears throat> encourage you to follow Drew. I think he is absolutely doing some of the most pioneering uh, and, and positive disruption work and couldn't agree more. The opportunity specifically to think about our frontline workers and be focusing on how we can help them close this career opportunity gap is gonna be incredibly important for the lives and the livelihood of all yeah, of our people. For sure. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thanks so much. Really appreciate it. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Seth.